uh, number of solar installations has doubled in the last year uh, since Maria hit. Uh, there were 10,000 solar installations before Maria. Almost none of them had batteries. There are another 10,000 installed now, and all of those have batteries at this point. Uh, so again, we're looking at critical facilities here. There are a number of efforts underway on the island to support various types of facilities from health clinics, which is work that we've gotten involved in with uh, direct relief, to schools and emergency shelters and, and fire stations. So these are, are really um, donation supported efforts, foundation supported efforts, um, but there are also a lot going on at the residential level, which is what most of those 10,000 systems are. So we've been involved with, as I said, Direct Relief and other organizations, the Clinton Foundation and the Solar Foundation that really spearheaded this effort called the Solar Saves Lives Initiative. Uh, and the goal of that program is to install uh, resilient solar and storage systems at health clinics in every municipality across Puerto Rico, along with two uh, large food markets in San Juan. This picture we're looking at here is actually the, the first completed of those projects. Um, this is at the Migrant Health Center in um, Maracao, Puerto Rico. And it's a nonprofit clinic that provides medical services to everyone, regardless of their ability to pay. Uh, so that was the start of this initiative. A few more have been installed and then since then, uh, we've worked with the groups on installations at, at five small community health clinics and, and three larger health clinics that are in development. Uh, but many more to come. I uh, had the privilege of going to Puerto Rico uh, just a couple of months ago uh, in San Juan um, to, to present at a meeting that uh, Direct Relief was putting on. And while I was there, I got to look at a couple of the health clinic projects that have been done. These are small community health clinics. Uh, this is Clinica Aea, and these are, these are both in San Juan. Uh, and they, they provide basic medical services and counseling to, to communities. Uh, throughout the city. Uh, these are pretty small installations. You know, this is about a 20 kilowatt solar installation, 20 kilowatt hour battery system. Uh, and the, the top, you see the solar system on the roof of the clinic. And then down below, uh, that's me with um, one of the folks from New Energy, which is the, the local uh, solar and storage installer that worked on the project. And this is Edwin Serrano, who's their logistics supervisor. He's showing me the, the batteries for this system. Uh, also went to another clinic called Clinica Pro Familia. Uh, it's a similar size system, 25 kilowatts of solar on the roof and 20 kilowatt hours of energy storage. Uh, the top picture there on the right showing the, the energy storage again, and that's one of the employees at uh, Pro Familia there. By it. Uh, and then there's the uh, disconnect switch down below that we're looking at. Uh, yeah, these again, these these are like I said, smaller systems. So they don't, in the event of an outage, they don't back up the whole facility. They're really intended to to focus on refrigeration for medications. Uh, you know, Direct Relief is a, a huge aid organization, international aid organization. When they came into Puerto Rico, they had brought uh, things like insulin and other medications that they were distributing throughout the island, but they found that wasn't of much use because there was no refrigeration available. Uh, which was necessary to keep the medication usable. So they are not an energy organization, but they got involved because they saw that in order for their work to be effective, there needed to be reliable access to energy. Uh, and that's, we, we got involved then to, to help offset some of the costs of getting these projects going, uh, providing some support directly to new energy to be able to, to have them work on these. A lot of this, again, the solar and energy storage is donated. Um, there have been some issues with that as far as having warranties for the systems, keeping them up and running. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to see how we can get beyond that model and get to a more sustainable model of installing these systems throughout the island. Uh, these are a couple of the, um, the pre-development uh, schematics for a couple of the larger systems. And these back up a lot more. So these are, are, are more like um, small hospitals than just community health clinics. So we're talking about over 200 kilowatts of solar and 60 to 100 kilowatt hours of energy storage. Uh, and these are intended to back up most of the building. Uh, I think about 75% of the, the normal load of the health centers to keep those up and operating when outages occur. Uh, I should say outages are still occurring. They, they were, um, really happening pretty frequently on a wide scale, even after 
folks were reconnected to the grid, and there's still concern throughout the island, particularly in more remote areas. I mentioned in the beginning the island of Vieques. Uh, they were served by PREPA, the, the Puerto Rico uh, utility, through an underwater transmission line. That line was damaged uh, in Hurricane Maria and will take years to restore. So the whole island, which is about 10,000 residents, is now being uh, served through large diesel generators on the island. Uh, what we're looking at here is the emergency management office for Vieques. It's the, the primary dispatch center, the primary first response. Uh, emergency operations are all coordinated out of this office. Uh, they do have a generator, one left that is running, but it has had a number of uh, issues. So if there is another outage, it has not proven to be particularly reliable. Uh, so we are supporting an organization called Footprints to be able to install a small seven kilowatt solar system and 20 kilowatt hour storage system that will back up 24-7 um, loads for, for the building. Um, all critical loads and, and maybe some non-critical loads as well for, for heating and cooling and, and some of the, the extra outlets for, for charging and keeping computers up and running. So another group we're working with, we're also focusing some of our efforts on really local community groups. Um, the one here, this is El Departamento de la Comida. It's the Department of Food. And they work with uh, more than 200 farms, community farms. These are farms that serve small communities of, of 300 people or le less, and really are focal areas for those communities, both as an employer and a provider, obviously, of, of food. Uh, so they had uh, put together a seed program, and they have a, a tools program for these farms in order to get them back up and running. Uh, during Hurricane Maria, they were crippled by the fact that not having electricity did um, impacted their refrigeration to keep foods from spoiling, and also their water pumps to keep things hydrated. Um, so a lot of crops were lost and a lot of these farms really struggled. Uh, so we're helping with this effort to support more uh, information sharing about resilient systems and trying to get some model systems up and running uh, so they can be replicated throughout other farms across the island. So beyond the project level, the, the other work that we're doing on the island is more of that top-down policy approach. Um, we got involved earlier on working on some uh, microgrid regulations for the island. Um, these were meant to um, make it uh, streamline the, the microgrid process. And that's really just islands, uh, systems are able to island and, and keep going when the grid is down. Uh, it was specifically focused on renewable uh, microgrids that are supported by, by solar generation and, and batteries. In addition to that, we um, worked with several stakeholders on the island, um, the um, folks that represent the renewable energy industry, as well as some community groups and uh, solar and storage providers, trying to put together a uh, draft proposal for some of the community development block grant disaster relief funds to be devoted towards an incentive program for resilient energy systems. This um, community development block grant or CDBG uh, funds are federal funds that are, are being apportioned to areas that are impacted by the hurricane. There's about um, 20 billion or, or so that is being apportioned, that's been apportioned to Puerto Rico. Uh, only about a billion of that has been uh, distributed at this point. And um, they are now getting in, in the process to release a second tranche. So the proposal, the draft proposal that we put together here, just the bullet points are basically we proposed a hundred or $1 billion behind the meter solar and storage incentive uh, for resilient systems. So behind the mirror just means it's at the customer site, not located on the distribution or transmission grid. So it's, it's specifically for buildings or a group of buildings instead of the grid at large. Um, along with a $100 million finance guarantee payment program, this is really meant to be targeted towards low income customers, uh, those that have poor credit ratings and are not able to install systems. The 10,000 systems that have been installed, that's mainly folks that can do this without financing, that have the economic means to go ahead and pay for systems. And so there's becoming this, this real disparity between those that have the ability to do that and those that don't. Um, those that don't are, are left to rely on a grid that is 
unstable and, and probably not going to get much better anytime soon. So uh, it's creating a real um, disparity in, in the, the equity of energy on the island. Uh, so this is meant to prioritize low income customers and critical services that provide services to communities. So since we put that out, we, uh, we filed that or we released that in early August and distributed that to a number of policymakers throughout the island. Then in September, September 21st, um, the um, Puerto Rican government uh, put out this Puerto Rico disaster recovery plan, which is the implementation plan for the second tranche of disaster relief funds. That's uh, $8.2 billion. In that program, uh, they basically set aside about uh, half a billion dollars in funds to support resilient energy systems. There's over 400 million for behind the meter energy storage systems. That's uh, prioritizing low income and elderly customers, also in communities where electrical power uh, is still not there. Uh, everyone's still not connected to the grid. Uh, there's also another 75 million for community uh, resilience centers throughout the island. And then a $100 million revolving loan fund. Uh, this is actually targeted towards the folks installing the systems, the developers, and, and not the customers. So it's a little different than what we proposed, but still meant to, um, uh, to, keep the, to, to enable them to do these systems, um, folks that have, have fallen on hard times, um, installers after Hurricane Maria. So we're still involved in this process. Uh, now it's looking at, okay, how is this program going to be? implemented and who's going to oversee the funds because this is a huge program um, and, and can really result in a, a transformation in the energy system on the island, uh, which is what a lot of people are going for. Um, there are also a lot of folks that are uh, proposing things like natural gas facilities and, and really building out the gas infrastructure. Um, that's not what we're proponents of, but it's another thing at the grid level that's being proposed. So that's, that's really all that I have at this time. I've got um, my contact information here, and I'm going to turn it over to Martin now, and we'll open it up to questions after his presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Seth. Seth that was really interesting. We have some questions coming in from our listeners through our Q&A window, which we'll save for the end of the webinar. If you're just joining us, we're speaking with Seth Mullender from Clean Energy Group and Martin Weinstein from Seal's Sci Center for Innovative Thinking about their work on improving energy access in post Maria Puerto Rico. Martin, I'd like to now turn the floor over to you. Great, hi everyone. Um, very excited to, to speak, particularly after Seth with an amazing presentation and some really cool stuff happening uh, with your group over there. Um, so I, I'm an innovator in residence at Site City um, and uh, also been part of uh, leading uh, an initiative called the Open Innovation Lab to try to look at um, how we find scalable collaboration for large problems like climate change and energy transition, and with a particular focus on some emerging technology that can help us uh, establish some scalar collaboration with, with a, a focus on blockchain. And uh, just like Seth gave a bit of a, a general background on, on what happened in, in the last um, uh, semester in, in Puerto Rico, uh, uh, two semesters ago actually, uh, I'd like to give a, just a general institutional context. I'm, I'm currently at the MIT Media Lab because this week was the members week where a lot of the projects happening at, at the Media Lab get showcased. And earlier this year, in, in regards to uh, starting to develop blockchain and energy research and, uh, and a focus on Puerto Rico, the Sci Center for Innovative Thinking uh, started a partnership with uh, the Media Lab with a specific, a specific group called the Digital Currency Initiative that focuses a lot on, on cryptocurrency and blockchain. Um, and so I, I, I come here as a bit of a, an ambassador of, of that project. Sorry, and, Martin, one, one thing, if you want to share your slides, then, then go ahead, but no problem if not. Yep. We don't see them at this moment, so I wasn't sure if you're planning on sharing. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't. Uh, let me start using slides now, but I, I, I will yeah, now no go Yeah, no worries. Into okay, great. Thanks. We just wanted to make um, sure it's working, so thanks for that. So... Uh, um, so I was saying this, this has been a, a shared partnership between, between Site City and the Digital Currency Initiative, and we also work very closely with the uh, Yellow Institute for Network Science. I want to talk very, very briefly on, on some of the, on the context. Uh, wait, let me, uh, this is uh, flowing. Um, on the context, uh, I'll skip through since Seth gave a, a good overview on that. I'll tell you a bit about the context from our research approach. Uh, and, and we have both a, 
a student team at Yale uh, working on this project and also a student team uh, at MIT. So it's been very exciting to see both universities um, shared efforts on this. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about some of the focus stuff on, on the technical front that we're working on, uh, but that can get relatively technical very fast. And so I'm also gonna try to leave that for, uh, for questions uh, later. And I'll tell you a bit about what we have now in place in, in, in Puerto Rico in one specific public school, um, and then some of the sharing of some of the next steps. So um, really when, when we, uh, when we started this this project, one of the first places we, we looked at is uh, in the British Virgin Island and really quickly moved to Puerto Rico because of the uh, the really the state in, in, in which the situation was there and it just didn't improve uh, fast. And, and a lot of uh, my previous work actually throughout my PhD was on the on the development of uh, peer to peer and resilient microgrids and uh, and social virtual power plants. Um, and so we thought this was a, a perfect model to start uh, working in Puerto Rico uh, to be able to develop. Now, uh, our initial vision and concept was to, to develop, and it still is, uh, an open source platform uh, where uh, buildings can, that, that have prosumer capability, both generation, consumption, and service provision can interact in a in an, in an interactive peer-to-peer -peer energy economy. And so uh, the model that, that Puerto Rico has in terms of energy is common throughout the world, is very centralized. And so uh, because of the uh, inevitable uh, rise of climate impacts through the region, uh, we needed to start thinking about new models that are that, that introduce a lot more of a transactive economy, not just through the, the physical value that microgrids produce, but also the, the possibility for empowering local communities to take more control of their energy economy. Um, and, and, and one of the first things we uh, realized early in, in the year was that we couldn't really have microgrids and transactive energy if we didn't have a way to allow the local communities to uh, finance the systems in the first place. Because one of the things that happens as soon as we start getting into a relatively complicated smart grid um, uh, models is that that facilitates um, being able to capture more value from the solar uh, panels and the batteries and smarter uh, devices, um, but we need to find financial models to, to deploy them in the first place. So one of our main focus um, that we have today is to um, look at, at developing some of these uh, financial models for paying uh, paying back the, uh, the, the solar systems. One of the uh, also focuses we had early on is started working with public schools. So we work with a network of 59 schools that are part of the 800 public schools in, in Puerto Rico that are part of the Montessori system. And the reason why we, uh, we started working with schools is they are, um, uh, and I think in the previous slide shows, the, the, we, we envision the school as an anchor point for a community microgrid. Uh, and I've, I've been to Puerto Rico a, a couple of times visiting and working with the school, and I can really say it's, it's amazing the, the role that the school uh, had before Maria, but even more now after Maria as a community node. And so if we, if we want to start developing more empowered uh, local energy economies and local economies in general, um, the school network was a, was a great starting point. Um, so because... Um, so the, I guess the, the general idea for what we're trying to work on is blockchain as a general uh, decentralized accounting uh, protocol um, has the features of being able to deploy what are called smart contracts. Smart contracts are essentially digitalized uh, agreements, uh, just like in a conventional paper contract, but that can automatize a lot of the establishments and agreements that are set to that. And a lot of the execution of those agreements can happen through uh, data-driven approaches. For example, uh, information that comes through IoT, internet connected devices, um, and that can execute uh, these smart contracts. So a logic that we had was, well, one of the things about starting to pay for solar systems is that as you pay, obviously you start becoming an owner of it. So um, we, 
we started working with a concept of smart property. So solar systems as a smart property, they will change ownership uh, uh, as the payments um, happen. And also being able to connect IoT device data streams that come from uh, the solar systems to execute those payments automatically. So if you look at this sort of like complex layer, essentially what this shows is we try to disintermediate the relationship between investors and end users uh, by digitalizing a lot of the process. Uh, we want to find ways of, of mobilizing the flow of funds from social impact investors from around the world to, in this case, uh, uh, public schools in Puerto Rico, but the same thing can be abstracted to any form of, of system around the world. Uh, if we want to uh, finance solar around the world, moving money around uh, in the world is, is actually a, a relatively more complex thing that we, we imagine, and that's where blockchain can bring in a lot of tools that can facilitate uh, the ease of moving value throughout the world. So um, that's one of the first things that, that we focus on is how do we bring in private capital to fund this. Uh, and then also, uh, and there's, uh, I'll go through just to general some of the layers that we're working on. But the main thing is that one of the things we want to um, embed into the system is ways to de-risk uh, the project to investors through guarantees and different ways in which in the case of a breach where the end user cannot pay for the system, the investor still gets protected, but also the end user doesn't go uh, dark. Um, and then in, in the other sense is try to make things affordable for end users. Again, we're working with the, with the public schools, so now I'm gonna talk a bit about why we start working with the concept and, and, the, and the instrument of a municipal bond. Now, and one of the ultimate goals of this project is to be able to reduce the time to, to finance and pay for solar to around four to five years. A conventional residential power purchase agreement lasts around 20 years. And so we, we, we really want to bring this down significantly. Um, so we have a finance layer that you can see here. We, we start working with a, with a company that has been able to digitalize through using blockchain technology, the clearing and settlement payments for municipal bonds. And so we thought that this was a great way for us to plug in our solar smart contract, uh, which, which I described this as data-based automatic payments where uh, an end user can pay uh, per kilowatt hour just as we would pay um, our bill, but in, a, in an automatic way, and, and, uh, and that can get transferred to the same uh, financial instrument, uh, either to the investor through the muni bond, or it can be in, um, in other models, for example, through equity crowdfunding. Uh, we have uh, there a layer, it's called an Oracle layer, and Oracles in, in blockchain jargon essentially are abstract computers that, that intermediate between data that comes from IoT devices um, and the execution of smart contracts. Because one of the key things is that we need to be able to ensure that the energy was generated and consumed. Uh, and the final layer where the Oracle also re regulates is uh, we're able to uh, produce renewable energy certificates and carbon certificates that can be used to reduce the cost of capital for the end user because that instrument uh, that takes the form of a token um, gets, gets minted, issued, thanks to the, uh, uh, the data, the proof of, of generation that gets produced and then transferred towards inv investors that can uh, also capture value through the token. Um, so with that general overview, our smart contract currently is, is, is written in a language called Solidity and is built in a prototype in what's called the Ethereum platform, uh, which is particularly developed as opposed to Bitcoin uh, to deploy smart contracts. And right now, our, our solar smart contract um, allows to automatically pay uh, to own the, the systems. And... Um, and that means that it can track the ownership uh, as the end user starts making those payments and generate renewable energy certificates, as well as uh, some form of cash flow risk mitigations that I can explain in the next slide. This one just explains a bit of how it can uh, interact between accounts. It uses the word wallets, which is uh, very common in, 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 in blockchain jargon, but we can, we can still think about, about how solar panels uh, through communication and, and data uh, trigger money um, transactions between accounts. Uh, here's an example of, of one of the things we work on, on cash flow risk mitigation, where uh, in the case of a breach, let's say an end user uh, cannot pay for um, the solar system or, or cannot pay for the electricity bill, um, the system eventually can trigger the entry of a guarantor that will ensure that that end user doesn't go into um, uh, 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 
doesn't get a lights out situation, which for, for particularly for uh, first responders, uh, schools, and, and definitely a lot of uh, the medical facilities that Seth talked about, this is uh, a critical. And it, it will do that by triggering hardware switches to export that energy directly to the grid. Um, uh, as a as a late late step, but uh, in the process have many layers of guarantors coming coming in and take over that. So here's probably one of the most interesting slides because we I was I was in, in Puerto Rico last week uh, working in a in a specific school uh, in a rural area called Aibonito, um, and this is the first one kilowatt system we installed uh, as a modular proof of concept um, that is grid tied and it's it basically covering. Um, uh, the the critical loads of the administration uh, building and particularly the uh, headmaster's office where there's uh, a small fridge which has some uh, medical um, uh, devices and also um, um, a te telecommunication um, port to be able to interact with first responders. One of the biggest issues that happened after Maria was that uh, uh, rather than not having energy, the biggest problem was that no one could communicate with each other. And obviously that relates to energy, but also to the re resilience of the, of the communication network around. So we really want to, to design emergency shelters, uh, the concept of emergency shelters within schools so that they can have ensured energy uh, communication. And that obviously gives them uh, resilient internet uh, and therefore uh, educational technology for, for schools. So this shows a bit of what the, what the model is currently doing in the, in the bottom image. We share, uh, there are a series of internet connected uh, energy metering uh, sensors and those are currently uh, triggering transactions on a smart um, contract. Now, what, what we, a couple of visions that we have um, for this is we, we've been working closely with the innovation office of Puerto Rican government and also the secretary of education because um, the, the public schools in Puerto Rico, the headmasters, they don't, they don't actually pay for the electricity bill. That all goes towards the Department of Education, which uh, basically at the end of, of, of the year uh, sends the, all the, the requirements for payments to the Treasury of, of Government. And so we think that by, by being able to uh, use an, a financial instrument like a municipal bond, um, the government is able to finance the deployment of solar and in public infrastructure such as schools uh, uh, with zero down payment and uh, and this obviously goes indirectly into a, an allocated cash flow that the government has uh, therefore it's it's a lot more let's say reliable than what would be for example the general obligation bond where one issues a bond to re-inject the economy of Puerto Rico uh, that normally produces a lot of complication because of the financial situation that the government is in. Um, and so uh, by doing this, we, we, we try to introduce um, a municipal bond that acts as financing more of a smarter infrastructure uh, that, that produces a bit, a bit more of a traceability from the investor side. Um, and this, I think the next couple of slides shows a bit of, of our proof of concepts and pilot pods. Uh, projects that we've done in the lab. This was built at the Center for in uh, Engineering, Innovation, and Design at Yale. Uh, this shows an overview of the school in Aibonito that we work with. Um, uh, and and we, our, our next steps are basically try to scale from one kilowatt to do a full pilot of this whole school. Uh, not not a, a really relatively big um, system because we are really differentiating critical loads versus non-critical loads. This allows the systems to be a bit smaller. Um, and, and our vision that we have with, uh, with the Secretary of Education and the government is to be able to use, uh, to make this, this uh, financial model more robust, to be able to finance the, the transformation of all of 800 schools, uh, public schools in Puerto Rico to become solar powered emergency shelters. Um, so I can obviously uh, answer to more technical questions, but, uh, but that's essentially what's, what's been our project since, since February. Thank you so much, Martin and Seth, both of you, for telling us about the meaningful work you're doing to build Puerto Rico's clean energy grid. So we will now be opening up the webinar for our Q&A portion. If you have questions, you can still submit them through the webinar's question menu. So go ahead and, and try to ask any question you would like to know more about. So one question that came in that would be interesting to pose to both of you um, is, given your knowledge and experiences, what do you see as some of the key barriers towards even more widespread adoption of solar and storage microgrids on the island? Seth, would you like to answer this question first? 
Sure, sure. I mean, the the barrier that we keep hearing again and again is is lack of financing. Um, they're just uh, there just isn't an, that that opportunity. Uh, you know, outside of the the folks that have high credit ratings, um, there aren't institutions that are able to take on the risk of financing systems to, to lower income consumers and that represents a, a large portion of the island much more than than you would find in, in the mainland states so um, that's that's a big problem um, another barrier that we run into talking to various installers on the island is just a lack of workforce trained workforce to be actually be able to get these things done um, and Another thing is lack of access to to batteries. Um, there's been a real supply chain issue there on the battery side. I think big question marks still uh, remain around what's going to happen with the power authority as well um, as that privatization goes forward. Uh, we don't really don't know what barriers are going to be put in place um, because the more systems that go online uh, at the customer level, that takes away the load from from the main utility, which makes it less valuable. Um, and it's a commodity right now that the government is trying to sell as part of the um, you know, bankruptcy that the, the island is going through. So that's mm -hmm. kind of a beginning of a laundry list. Yeah. Mm. Well, thanks for that. Yeah. The, and I guess, and I, sorry, no, Martin, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I, I basically can echo exactly what, what Seth said. And in fact, you know, we started this project trying to focus on transactive community microgrids and thought that our main bottleneck was going to be the regulatory situation with um, with with PREPA, but that also uh, applies to almost any any uh, place in the world today about regulations for transactive energy. Uh, and by transactive energy, I mean like uh, uh, structures where you can uh, sell energy to your neighbor and back and forth and services like demand response. Uh, but then immediately we realized that the, the main model was finance, and that's that's a bit where, where we focused our our um, our research, and that's that's been based on basically what we saw on the ground, and we wanted to unlock uh, new models for private capital um, and an impact capital to flow towards this region in a way that that doesn't take a lot of uh, large marginal legal cost. That means that the time to set up a contract uh, because uh, in, in a normal power purchase agreement uh, or pay to own uh, agreement, these are really large documents and it requires lawyers. So even if you don't have the upfront capital, you still have to deal with all the, all the contracts for it. So what we really want to be able to work through uh, the, the rise of these two technologies to digitalize a lot of the contract. So to reduce the legal marginal cost. And, and that's, that's, I think, one of the main things that also our conversation with people in rural Puerto Rico says, you know, we want to have solar panels in our house. Uh, and, and I guess I also can share some of the things that, that I've seen on the ground in regards to uh, Seth's comment of uh, still not a lot of people uh, having the right capability to deal with a, a large deployment of this. Uh, and I've seen some very interesting things. For example, last week, there was a couple of, uh, I, I normally get very hands-on involved with the deployment just because I, I find it a lot of fun and I, and I find a way of, of connecting a lot with, with, with local developers because I want to be able to understand that. And also the reason because within the legal con the contracts that we're digitalizing are also the role of the local contractor that we want to also empower and also make sure that all those transactions are also ready. Recorded. Um, but what I wanted to share is I found um, when I was missing uh, some breakers for a specific a, a DC or AC disconnect, uh, I found uh, pop-up solar um, stores basically in the back of auto part uh, uh, stores around the island in almost like remote areas of the island. And that is because there's been a huge surge in demand for solar. And so basically people that, that sell auto parts are basically now start, uh, selling basically kind of like state of the art solar e equipment and, and, and don't even uh, post it on, in, in Google or online. So it's, I'd, I'd have to, I had to, to search for some of these things uh, go through local uh, networks of, um, and that that's basically shows a, a, an emerging informal economy developing in the island. Yeah, that's super interesting. Thanks for sharing that. That's, that's really fascinating. Um, another question that came in related to financing was, was for Youssef, and it was, um, 
how are community center microgrids being being financed and what's the business case to support the private financing? Yeah, that's a, a good question. And um, I think how they're being financed is is still a lot up in the air. Um, you know, in Puerto Rico, like you said, it's, it's a lot, a donation model right now. Uh, in the States, you know, we are seeing some places where um, the savings can be used to, to finance, uh, but that's pretty localized. Uh, you know, that should be a way that things can move forward in, in Puerto Rico, particularly on the solar side. Uh, they face very high uh, energy costs uh, per kilowatt hour. And the, the economic case for solar is really pretty good. Um, but, you know, as Martin said, this is, you know, these are pretty long contracts that people get involved in, and then there are a lot of transactional costs in that. Uh, so it's very difficult. Um, the, the idea, uh, you know, something we've been trying to work on is, is getting multiple projects together so they can be bundled together as one transaction to lower that financing cost. Um, but that's also a very difficult process that the, the number of folks are working on. Um, so I don't know if I've really answered the question there. I, I think that there's a lot, uh, still a, a developing area around that. It, it's, it's not easy. Um, there are places where the savings alone it can justify the financing, uh, but those those tend to be bigger projects, and um, you know, or, or bundling a lot of smaller projects together. So, this area we're working on. I, Martin, I don't know if you have anything you can add to that. No, I mean, I, I think it's a, a lot of the issues around financing you mentioned are definitely the ones that we try to, you know, find uh, workarounds using using more. Uh, uh, digital legal uh, contracts, uh, and and that's that's definitely also through the um, through the savings that that facilitates the the deployment of solar with zero doubt payment, and also um, in the case of a bond, we can have fluid uh, maturity periods of the bond. That means like the period in which you end up paying uh, all your principal, the the initial uh, capital that the project needs. Um, and so we, when I said that we really wanted to bring the payment uh, down to four to five years, that is very sensitive to, um, uh, to the tariff. And so right now, uh, a common tariff in Puerto Rico is around 23, uh, but it can go all the way up to 25 or, 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 or higher cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, that also applies to the Department of Education. Uh, in the case that PREPA gets... Um, uh, privatized, I am I'm pretty sure they are going to have a certain cap because of social considerations. But it often happens that tariffs goes up, go up because they need to repay a lot of uh, financing of the general centralized infrastructure, the transmission and distribution lines, and fixing a lot of that stuff. So if the tariffs goes up for us, you know, for a solar uh, finance model, it's good news in the sense that you are able to mature a finance periods faster. And that's essentially what we want to produce is we want to increase the, the speed in which the solar system goes and becomes uh, owned by the end user. Um, therefore, after that, they, they don't have to, they don't have any obligation. They fully own the system, et cetera. So another question that's kind of related to that, Martin, that came in for you is, how do you plan on mitigating the poor credit ratings that would increase the cost of capital for municipal bonds? And how do you aim to attract investment at scale? Yeah, so, um, and I think uh, the first thing, one of the things we, and obviously this is part of our, our hypothesis, is that uh, when you generate, uh, let's say a, a municipality generates a general obligation bond, or the government produces a bond, uh, Puerto Rico doesn't have a good uh, credit rating. It's it, right now. It's basically kind of like a country in bankruptcy. Um, it would be the same thing if if Prepa would like to issue a bond. Uh, people would have a really hard time buying it. Um, uh, but that is that. That's why we want to unbundle the the bond financing model to 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 go uh, tap into very specific. Uh, infrastructure where you already have to at least uh, uh, pay for your electricity, and so we um, we we need to make sure that who issues the bond uh, is already paying for electricity, um, and therefore this just taps into their uh, already current allocated cash flow. It's not like an extra expenditure that they have. Uh, that is, I, I think, a, a critical component of that. Second one is to be able to have uh, guarantors uh, in place that 
that have the interest of, of protecting specific critical loads. Um, and so, uh, you know, here we have uh, constant uh, chats with the, uh, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, who are very interested in, in, in these things. Uh, Puerto Rico, obviously, is not part of their um, uh, working uh, countries, but uh, they, uh, they understand their role as a guarantor to try to uh, allow, you know, development, and rather than doing uh, straight up uh, donations or installations, they could take the role of uh, uh, what in blockchain would be a, a, a guarantor a, a wallet account. And so that's what we would put into place to protect um, in, investors. And then the third part, again, is that let's say if the end user, and not in the case of a public school, you really can't put them in the dark, someone doesn't pay the electricity bill, we can, we can bypass the end user and then sell directly to the grid. And so if, if, if PREPO allows that, then we protect investors by at least uh, um, ensuring them a fee in tariff. Great. So you, yeah, you talked a little bit about your collaboration with the Inter-American Development Bank. And we were actually wondering um, what other U.S. government agencies um, you both have worked with for, with your efforts. So are, are you familiar with programs at USDA, HUD, or the Department of Energy? And have there been other collaborations that have been helpful? Um, for, this is a question for both of you. Uh, so, I, I mean, I can, I can start off. Um, yeah, we, we, we've had, we've worked with a number of different agencies um, with varying degrees of success. Uh, we actually collaborate a lot with Department of Energy, um, but that tends to be on the, um, the project side of things and the analytical side. Uh, we, we work with the uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, a lot on, on analytical side of things. On um, the project side, we worked with uh, Sandia National Lab. Uh, through the uh, there's an energy storage technology advancement partnership that is comes out of the the Department of Energy Office of Electricity. This tends to be for for grid scale uh, solar and, and, and mainly energy storage deployments. Uh, but they've provided technical assistance and some funding support to to projects. Uh, as far as the other government agencies, we've worked with um, some projects that have gotten support through you know financing support through USDA uh, that have had requirements for uh, off-grid potential. So a certain percent of the load has to be uh, available to be uh, off-grid and critical loads um, as part of the, the financing, uh, better financing terms. Uh, we have worked with, with HUD. We work with affordable housing quite a bit. Um, they, in our experience, tend to be more of an obstacle than, <laughs> than a help in the process. Um, Although the like the the money coming through the uh, community development uh, funding, the disaster relief funding that is being administered through through HUD and the housing agency in in Puerto Rico is is overseeing that that effort. So, um, you know, I, I can't say of a, um, a government entity that that's been a real partner on this outside of the, the national lab work, um, but you know, we're, we're trying to collaborate there with, with a number of folks. Great, thank you. And, and Martin, how about you? How has your project collaborated or interacted with other US agencies, if any? Um, yeah, from, from our side, uh, in terms of like direct uh, US development agencies, we haven't had any interaction um, yet. Uh, most of our relationship has been with the innovation office in the Puerto Rican government uh, and the education office in the, uh, in the Puerto Rican um, government. And, and, and there's a particularly, a, we work in the intersection between FEMA, the Federal uh, Emergency Management Agency and the education um, uh, office. Uh, so we interact a lot with, uh, with a project manager that is really managing that bridge. Um, to try to uh, uh, work on, on conceiving the, the model of emergency shelters to schools. Uh, and that's been, and then we also have like local uh, solar developers uh, that we partner with on the ground that want to foster these type of, of models. Um, and then we, we've, we have a lot of uh, loose partnerships because we're in the interface of blockchain and energy um, with a lot of people that are working on blockchain energy initiatives around the world, uh, in Europe, here in the United States. Um, we already have a partnership between SciCity and the MIT Media Lab, um, and so it, it it we get a lot of attract uh, traction and attraction because 
of the interest in the technology. Uh, but in specifically in regards to um, uh, Puerto Rico, we mostly have been trying to work with the government because we've approached that more of a, uh, a local bond model. Yeah, I'll just one, one more thing on my side. We, we do work a lot more with, with state agencies. Uh, and a lot of those are through, you know, federal funding programs, whether it's um, community development block grant funding or FEMA disaster funding. Um, a number of states have set up either grant programs or like California has a, an incentive program to for uh, energy storage. So we work a lot with, with state agencies and, and have a lot more um, collaboration with those folks. And I could also add that one of the things that we, we really have as, as a side uh, interest is that by next year when we finish our pilots, uh, we see that what we've been working on can have a direct application to development agencies because one of the things that happens in, de in development aid is, is, is that the flow of money actually gets diluted in the process. It's hard to track. It's hard to, to visualize where those funds go. And so by being able to use uh, an accounting, uh, decentralized accounting system like blockchain, we want to be able to track a lot of that process. And because we've been now working on public finance model, I'm, I'm for example, originally from Argentina, uh, which has had a lot of history of corruption in public financing. And that's because there's a lot of tra uh, transparency in the process between uh, issuers of, of, uh, of, of contracts and contractors. And so a lot of the things that we see is trying to generate technology for that. Great, thank you so much. That's both really interesting to hear about your collaborations and, and your plans for the future. Um, we have a time for, I think, a few more questions. One question that came in from the audience was directed towards you, Seth, um, and it's um, whether solar panels are as resilient in the case of disasters as generators are, um, because they seem very exposed in the case of hurricanes. Um, if they're more likely to go down, do you feel like it is okay to put these systems on hospitals instead of a more secure or robust system? And related to that, um, have you evaluated the use of a diesel generator in the microgrid to have a more reliable grid? Yeah, uh, so a lot in there to address. Uh, you know, sorry, on, on, yeah. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> Let's see. I think your screen froze. Are you still with us, Seth? Well, we wait for him to get back online. I can probably make a comment around that. Yes, um, please. Thank you. <laughs> so when, when one has to design a resilient energy system, you have to uh, consider the, the sizing of the panels and the sizing of the battery bank. So Seth gave a lot of information about battery bank sizes, and that's very important. Now, uh, in a case of an emergency where things get island, it means that the, the building, like a large medical facility, uh, has to self-sustain itself uh, for its critical loads. And critical loads is very important because you don't want to drain your batteries uh, and allocate your solar generation to your air conditioning, which is more of a comfort thing. Uh, you do want to keep it for the refrigerators that are specifically important. And so you have to do a very delicate design of the system. And then the role that the generators has is still very important um, in, in our system is, is ready and uh, to have a, a generator connected to the system so that in the case, for example, that uh, solar panels get uh, damaged in the, in the case of a hurricane, there's been a lot of um, uh, can you guys still hear me? Because I'm, I'm getting an unstable internet connection. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so it, it would be terrible to lose both of us at once. Um, exactly. Uh, no, you're so still with us, luckily. There's been a lot of uh, you know, uh, solar panels that were damaged after the hurricane. Uh, I've seen pictures of fields that, that has gone through some very bad beating uh, of it. So it's not that, that solar panels are, are just hurricane proof. That's why insurance also has a very important role. And there's ways in which you install panels to prevent that from happening. And definitely Puerto Rico is a place to do a lot of research of, of, of improved anchoring of, of solar arrays. Um, so what I wanted to also say is that you can have generators that don't kick in and cover all of your critical loads, you can reduce the size of your generator so that in the case of your, your solar output, because it's a cloudy day, uh, what the generator will do is will trigger based on the state of charge of the battery bank, recharge the battery bank and let the bank continue to do its work. So that is very, very good for 
many reasons. It, it reduces the size of the generator that you have to buy and install, and it also significantly reduces the the footprint because generators end up. If you turn on a generator to power all your systems, it's going to have a lot of uh, um, yeah basically spinning capacity in, 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 in the generator that you want to uh, avoid. So we'll just turn off, charge the batteries back up and let the batteries deal with it. And so yes, generators, that's a long answer to say yes, generators have a role, uh, but there's uh, improved ways in which you can design the system for that. Great, thanks for that, Martin. So I'm afraid that we still have lost Seth. I'm not sure if he'll still be joining us for our, our last question because we have come to the last question of the webinar. Um, so, yeah, we, we, so we've seen some stories about how power has recently finally been restored to those who had lost it, but some expensive improvements are needed to the larger grid, and it's not really clear where that funding will, will come from. So this makes the Blueprint team wonder, what do you see for the future of the Puerto Rico energy grid? I'm really curious um, for your opinion. As a, as a general, what, what, what do we see as a future for, for the grid? Um, I mean... I think that from from my angle, um, I, I you know I, I did my 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 doctoral uh, research on the transformation of the global energy business system and the design of new uh, uh, grid models. And so when when the hurricane happened, I started working on Puerto Rico. Um, you know, I immediately uh, thought about be, basically bringing a lot of those ideas to to the grid. And, uh, and we started working a lot on community-based microgrids because uh, we think that uh, energy needs to, historically energy is, is, is almost like a controlled monopoly. And, uh, and we need to be able to change that into a more of a prosumer model. And we wanna find business models that are able to empower uh, bottom-up approaches to that. Um, so I envision uh, a lot more community-based microgrids and not just envision, obviously we try to work on technology for that and, and work with uh, getting Puerto Rico to be on the, on the state of art of the conversations around regulations that allow more peer-to-peer -peer and transactive energy. Um, and, and let me also say that, that, that one of the things about microgrids is not just for resilience against emergencies is that once you start having a, a lot of solar and wind, and, and right now, most of Puerto Rico power comes from imported uh, hydrocarbon. And so this, this also produces a, a, a huge a constraint and dependency to the, to the island. Uh, and let us not forget that in 35 years, the world, the entire planet should be at zero emissions, thanks to the, uh, what we've agreed in the Paris Agreement to achieve 1.5 degrees. So that, that gives us under 35 years to radically shift all of the world's power system. So if we have a higher penetration, of solar and wind, we need to have more um, uh, response for our energy devices. So a lot of more smartness in the edge, in the edge being in the consumer side, in the buildings, in the devices. And so Puerto Rico has the capacity now to take the lead and be uh, an, an, uh, a mo model for a, a modern uh, transactive energy and, and future grid which is, uh, I, I am convinced, um, cheaper, more resilient, and more uh, economically uh, empowering than any other model. Uh, so uh, I've, I've been very inspired by the, by the Puerto Rican situation because it's a, it's, a, it's a place of opportunity to be able to bring in a new energy vision, uh, and that should be adopted by um, even, even cities and, 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 um, and uh, definitely all island communities. Uh, that's a, that's a definitely my vision. Great. Thanks so much, Martin. So we have a lot to digest here. And it seems like there's a lot of work to be done, but it's really inspiring to hear what you and Seth are doing to build a more resilient clean energy grid in Puerto Rico. So I think we're out of time. This concludes today's talk on clean energy access in Post Maria, Puerto Rico. Martin and Seth, who we unfortunately lost a few minutes ago, thank you so much I'm for back. joining us today. <laughs> oh, oh, great. Back. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> sorry, I'm on the phone. Here. Our internet went down, but sorry, folks, I no, didn't get to that no question. <laughs> We're happy to have you back for, the, for our conclusion. <laughs> so uh, I would just quickly point people to a Rocky Mountain Institute report that talks about um, solar panels. These are, are, are uh, not on rooftops, but it, it's a good overview of uh, how to install solar panels for, for solar arrays to withstand hurricanes. 
Wonderful. Thanks so much for that, Seth. We'll be looking into that with the Blueprint team this afternoon for sure. So thank you both for joining us. We also would like to thank the Blueprint audience for all your questions. We'll forward any remaining questions to, to the speakers. So to view a recording of this webinar, please visit the events tab on the Yale CBay website or access the recording through CBay's YouTube page. Thanks so much again for joining us. Until next time, this is Sofia Caicedo from the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Seth. And thanks for everyone that's been uh, hearing this. Thank you. Have a yeah. nice afternoon. Bye. Take it easy.